So thank you. It's a real privilege to be here, and in particular, thanks to Ruth for a truly inspirational speech to start us off with today. So I'm going to talk about a copyright in the higher education sector and sort of go through some of the data we've been collecting about what's happening, really referring very specifically to scholarly publishing and taking as my theme elephants and copyright. That is, we each touch you know, the classic story of the blind men and the elephant and what did they experience and one said it was like a brush, the other said it was you know, a, smooth, a smooth object and seeing the whole beast as we have discussed is one of our biggest challenges. So I'm just taking a little bit uh, the concept of uh, higher education. So. There's been a lot of disruption in higher education in terms of scholarly communication, particularly around open access. And I've slightly more complexified this um, than the three, uh, the concept of stakeholders, authors and readers, to include funders. And uh, I guess the reason universities stand out as being slightly different is that they are funded primarily by the Australian and federal and state governments, funded both for the ongoing operations of the university and research funding from the Australian Research Council and National Health and Medical Research Council. So there's a big national investment here. Um, the, the other challenge uh, that I've added is the potential users. So the government funds the research that happens within universities with the intention that it will contribute to better outcomes, whether it's industry outcomes, whether it's social science outcomes, whether it's political outcomes, whether it's development goals. Um, and so it's actually a map of quite a lot of forces that have invested significantly in the process of research and education. Um, and the open access policies, as you know, were adopted by the Australian Research Council in 2012 and National Health and, Health and Medical Research Council the year after. And they, while the intention is absolutely great, it's a bit like co copyright in a way in that it is an enormously complex beast with a whole lot of different aspects depending on the research output and what stated it is in. <laughs> but just having taken that broader perspective, what is it, she says, pressing the wrong button, that authors really want in terms of the rewards within uh, a higher education environment? Well, in higher education, the rewards are not financial, and I'll go into that in a bit more detail. They are really about impact and engagement, as we would um, use the terms in Australia defined by the Australian Research Council through the Excellence in Research Australia process. There is absolutely overwhelming evidence that in fact openly publishing whatever version of the research output increases citations, so it increases the transmission of knowledge, which in a sense is the principle, one of the principles behind copyright, that, that complex transmission. Um, and there's been much measurement of scholarly communication, um, influence citations, um, influence in terms of changing policies. Uh, so the difference between those research outputs that are behind a paywall that Ruth talked about this morning that cannot be got um, compared to those that can be got is actually enormous. So if we're talking about a return on investment to the government from its investment in education, these are factors that make us think about copyright in slightly different ways, or rights management. In addition to achieving fame and international travel, um, which we, we want all researchers and academics to achieve, the, uh, there is overwhelming evidence of an increasing impact in education from open access educational resources. These are two extracts and the slides will go up and there is a link to the journal article underneath it and the article is openly accessible. Um, We've used, we've developed open access textbooks at ANU. They are published now by the ANU Press, which I'm also responsible for, as well as the library. And the outcomes have been that the student satisfaction in these, in particularly this is a course that was done, um, uh, the plant detective, so it's a, a biology, a bioscience course, that student satisfaction through open educational resources and some changing educational practices rose to over 90%. There was huge retention of students and the number of students increasing to honours um, improved. So the actual outcomes when you're talking about the measurement of the benefits of managing copyright in different ways to the education system in Australia and to the knowledge basis in Australia can be, can be radically different to what we've been seeing just in 
terms of what we've measured in communications activities before. But the bottom line and the thing that we, we always come back is we are um, not just part of a knowledge economy, but a, a monetary economy. So much is discussed about money and what is the impact. Remember, I'm only talking here about scholarly communication. I'm not talking about trade publications, fiction, children's works, um, but about what is, what is actually that we are trading financially with our researchers. So I did a study of authors in 2016 to ask them what were their publishing trends, what were the issues in that, uh, what did they actually publish in the last two years, what did they spend, what did finances did they receive, to try and put it in perspective to see what it meant for, for a group of academics in a university. So publishing, not at all surprising, is at the heart of our universities and book chapters, journal articles, books, other publications were an important part of the research outputs. Interestingly, data was not seen. I mean, I did ask them about data as well, but at that stage in 2016, it wasn't as much a, a metric that they were conscious of in terms of publishing data sets. And then ask them questions about what are you paying the publisher? So generally speaking, payments to publishers were fees for publishing journals, not so much for books, uh, and were uh, for third party copyright materials, um, were for uh, payments for colour images, tables, the sorts of value that publishers add added additional costs that they charge for. Interestingly, open access payments were around the same. Um, and while they were small in number, the, the contribution from Australia is actually quite significant. So Public Library of Science, which is probably, well, was the largest and is possibly now the second largest uh, open access publisher with around 25,000 articles a year published. So it's a mega journal and it's open access on the basis of author fees. They, about a quarter of their revenue comes from Australia, which is about $10 million a year paid by Australia in order to facilitate the publishing. So it's an interesting model and we're seeing, of course, more open access payments made. In the US, they get, um, there, there are more mega journals happening and, of course, in the UK, there are, the government has agreed to pay open access fees with some limitations after the Finch report. So it's a whole changing pattern often thanks to government intervention. But the other question, and this slide is impossible to read, it's all right, you'll get the slide set, and the article is being published. Uh, I asked them, well, what, how much money do you get? Because when we talk to academics, there's concern that if we change rights management issues that there might be a diminution of the revenue that is received by authors, but in fact, the amount that authors receive is remarkably little. This is broken down in great detail. Um, but uh, one of the key messages really is that authors achieve more in the academic environment, uh, more particularly book publishers, of course, from the educational learning right and the public lending right than they do from any other form of revenue. That may not be surprising, but it actually shows that, that in terms of a policy investment, while the impact is small, it is significant enough for people to notice. So what do we need in terms of rights payments and how does it play out, I think, is an interesting environment for us to think about copyright and how it fits. Um, so the typical scholarly author, two to five articles a year, have a book chapter, they pay less than $2,500 for publishing, uh, more for books than journal articles, the standard fee if you want an open access book published. And ANU Press, I should say, does not charge fees for publishing. Um, is $15,000, and that's widely talked about in the industry these days, but there are different models of publishers. So the main payments to authors, a little bit of royalties for book authors, um, electronic uh, educational lending rights and public lending rights, copyright society payments, 95.4% uh, of book authors receive nothing. Again, their benefits from publishing are about their career and the communication of scholarship. It's not a monetarised environment for them. 97.7% of journal articles received uh, zero. And I've got to say, part of the incentive for me to do this bit of data collection was Tom, you on radio um, ABC, talking about the uh, economics of the environment and that journal authors got nothing. And I thought, well, someone should do some research around that. So. 
uh, this was to try and add some more information for the discussions that we have with the department so we can be talking about what, what's the reality like in scholarly publishing. So there's quite a lot of data that we've collected that goes to the environment and the rewards and the benefits for a scholarly author that is different to um, a non-scholarly author and the industry needs to be different. So what are some of the things we need to think about changing from a higher education point of view? Um, and also I'd like to add into that, what do we need to do to make sure that we are implementing what is government policy and government policy making within Australia? The sort of thinking behind the Gov 2.0 report, the Productivity Commission report into um, intellectual property, ARC and NHMRC open access policies. So we have a government that is committed to getting a return on the investment from their investment in higher education, which is primarily funded by the government. So if that's the framework that we need to think of rights management in, in terms of those broader policy decisions, what are some of the major issues that we need to think about? So can we revolutionise the way our researchers participate in the environment to prioritise that? Um, Patrick Dunleavy, who's a part-time appointee at the University of Canberra and a distinguished professor at the London School of Economics, has come up with a new open access citation model and we'll be running a seminar on that in this building um, in early April, late March to try and then tease out some mechanisms that we can use to incentivise that. Are there other changes that we need to look to on a worldwide environment given that libraries pay millions and millions and millions of dollars to publishers and often get very limited and the, and the authors get very limited rights. So what can we do to change that? Finland have just signed an agreement with Elsevier where there is a 50% reduction in open access fees for authors. So there's an author benefit from the library investment that changes the contractual relationship. And there are many big debates, and you may well see one in Australia later this year with major publishers about rights and how we can better protect rights on the basis of the purchase agreements. But there is also a lot of discussion um, around what's been proposed in the UK, a scholarly communication licence where authors would retain the rights for reuse based on a licence that the university would do the work to negotiate with publishers. So that's been going on for the last 18 months and part of the challenge for us, and again, the issue of looking at contracts and copyright um, is a really good opportunity for us to try and tease out, should Australia be part of this um, international consideration and should, should we support an environment where an author can basically sign away all rights in their firstborn, should there be protection of rights, of some reuse rights with embargo periods that are agreed with the publisher to be able to give that return on the government's investment. So there are some very interesting challenges. And again, the issue of mega journals, you know, are, is it making copyright redundant to actually think that over 45,000 journals were published last year in just two mega journals where it's a completely different rights environment um, and those resources are open access. So. I guess in terms of the copyright legislation, flexibility for edu the educational context, higher educational context is critical. I think we've got a real issue around determining um, how far we should go and having conversations about the rights of authors uh, and also the concept of legislation supporting the national science and innovation agenda to actually be able to position Australia to get the benefit from a, what is a hugely successful investment, um, but has locked up too much within paywalls to actually get some of the return that the government could quite reasonably expect. So it is an elephant. There are many different parts that we will assess, uh, and we will be trying to contribute either to the head or the tail or the side part um, through our contribution in the next year, but I hope that was useful information for you all. Thank you. So I should have said to start off with, of course, with this session we'll uh, do questions at the end. We'll uh, have a bit of a group discussion on the panel um, and then bring up questions as part of that.
Uh, so our next speaker, who will be focusing on uh, issues of education and TAFEs for um, schools, Australia schools, is Delia Brown, of the, North, uh, the National Copyright Director of the National Copyright Unit of the Copyright Advisory Group of the COAG Education Council. I always have to read it to get it all right. <laughs> I think everybody in the room knows Delia, honestly. Um, so, as we all know, she's been one of the most strongest and most influential voices in copyright reform in Australia, really, for the last decade. She has a very strong background as a copyright expert, um, and she's worked very, very strong also in areas of open access and to increase flexibility. Um, she's one of the strongest advocates for flexibility and adaptability and fair use in Australia, so it'll be really interesting to hear her opinions. <clears throat> Hi everybody. So um, just to add on to what Rebe um, Jessica just kind of, the kind introduction and thank you for inviting me to here today. Um, I haven't got a PowerPoint. I'm just going to point you to the Smart Copying website because in the law reform section there we've got a really good bunch of fact sheets about the recent changes that happened in 2017 and some of the responses we've had to some of the myths that have been sort of propagated or some of the confusion or clarification um, in relation to the position of perhaps the school and TAFE sector, which is pretty consistent with the university sector as well. So I'm just going to point to that. I have a PowerPoint, but I, I kind of don't like it after listening to the, to the wonderful um, presentations by Ruth and Jill this morning, so I'm just going to kind of talk. I also want to explain what the National Copyright Unit does. So we do report to the Ministers of Education and to the Secretaries of the various State Department and Territory Departments of Education. We provide like practical advice to teachers in everyday situations and copyright. So people, all the schools and TAFEs can access to getting some practical copyright advice on a de by email or by phone. The Smart Copying website is an, a fantastic resource that enables, it gives really practical what can I do without completely trying to make it overly complex for teachers and librarians and, uh, and, and educational users of copyright. We're a huge user of copyright, and so it's important that we try and give them a framework that they feel comfortable and empowered. So we try and do that through the Smart Copying website. All our slides and stuff that we do, we make available on SlideShare. Everything we do is licensed under Creative Commons by the most flexible license. And of course, you know, one of the things that Jessica mentioned that we do is we also try and promote the use of CC licenses in education um, and in government because it's, you know, where there's something that's been paid for by taxpayers' money, particularly by departments of education, it's important that it's able to be shared and used by teachers and over, you know, over, you know, through states and territories, etc. So that's been something that we've been a huge part of. And I'm also involved in CC Australia with QUT. Um, and also being a very active member of the International CC Global Network. So just giving a bit of a background on that. Now, education has completely changed in the, since 2005 I've been in this position. It's incredibly different now. We're not talking about the photocopier or video recorder anymore. We're not talking about kids being in a classroom where, like you are now, listening to me and taking notes. It's a much more collaborative um, uh, uh, environment for learning is now a, teach, a digital teaching environment where you've got use of iPads, you've got the flipped classroom, you've got uh, teachers now expend, experimenting with augmented reality. Uh, you've got also the fact that a lot of schools now have bring your own devices. We're looking at AI. We're looking at uh, you know looking at using lots of different platforms that are now offering open education resources or free education resources, which they'll be either things like. Uh, you know, Edmodo is one particular platform, Verso. You're also looking at things like, you know, some really great subscription websites that are now available for schools and teachers and students to subscribe to, like Mathletics, um, and which is one of the, you know, really, really successful um, kind of product that's been developed in Australia. But the problem, as I've said before, is our lawyers are pretty outdated and, and, and outdated. They're all done for the video copier and the photocopier back in the 70s and 80s, and now we've got the iPad, the 3D printer, data and text mining, artificial intelligence, etc. And this is not a problem just for Australia. There's inconsistent rules all around the world. I'm not going to go into much detail there. We've also got this push for STEM, you know. 75 of the fastest growing occupations is, requires a STEM skill set. So there's a worldwide drive by governments and education everywhere to kind of like provide specialist STEM education. And the OECD reports that Australia has actually got quite severe STEM deficits at the moment. So we need to actually move this forward, and that's been also an issue that's been raised by the business community. 
Um, and also in schools, what's happening now is that schools are becoming more involved in, work, in providing and working with business. So a lot of business are actually offering internships in the last two years of schools. They want to get school-based challenges. They want innovative, hands-on, practical work. So we're seeing a lot more collaboration with business and community than we did before. So these are all kind of factors we're going to take into consideration. We also have a complex copyright act. And you say 20 years, I say 25. Um, and, you know, when I came to Australia in 1996, there was only 300 pages of the Copyright Act. And I think, how many are there now? Almost a thousand? And I've been responsible for some of those, you know, additions, so like, I'm, you know, moral rights, it's my fault. Um, but it is complex because we have a situation where, unlike most other countries who have statutory licences, um, which uh, we pay remuneration uh, for, and, the, and as a result of those licenses, there's a lot of obligations schools, TAFE universities have to, uh, to do. Um, and we also, uh, because of those licenses that were really created in the best public policy interest back in the 80s, which was, we don't want the photocopying being used to photocopy textbooks, we don't buy textbooks. We don't want the video recorder being used, so it's, doing, you know, it's going to damage the film industry. So there were some good public policy reasons back in the 80s. But now what's happened is those statutory licenses, particularly uh, the new section one, the one that's done, administered by Cal at the moment, it does cover everything, absolutely everything. And that includes freely available internet material and things like health fact sheets that the departments of health are doing and things like that. So here's some examples of what is actually not really free in Australia because it actually is encompassed and paid for under the statutory license. And these are real life examples that, we have, that have come up in the surveys. Displaying an image of a cat on screen from petfinder.com.au. Taking a screenshot of a website that compares times in different cities around the world. And I noticed a few of you taking screenshots today. Well, that's renewable under the statutory license. <laughs> Publishing a fact sheet on headlines from the Department of Health. We would want this to be handed out to parents and school children. Uh, or ageing website, uh, taking a screenshot of a yellow raincoat from a Bunnings catalogue to include in a PowerPoint. So those are just real life examples. So um, it's kind of like it's covering that stuff. We're also not clear in the current regime how does educational use of educational apps work out in this new environment. And also the other you know, thing we have to talk about with the increasing use of internet material in schools, this is also Im impacting the amount of orphan works schools are using, because a lot of stuff that you find on the internet, you may not be able to find out who is the copyright owner. You know, who do you actually pay when it's being captured? So these are just things we have to kind of contend with. Now, Sam, your department and your minister, we love you. Uh, it was fantastic seeing the amount of reforms that went through last year. I have to uh, say to people, like Sam has been around for a long time, as I have, and a number of other people, but I want to, it takes years to get some of these reforms through. So um, the easiest one was the uh, Copyright Amendment, Disability Access, and Other Measures Act. Now, this is hilarious, because that was, an, that was a reform that everyone was singing Kumbaya, Kumbaya to, because we worked together to get some you know, some low-hanging fruit, stuff that the, all the rights holders, the education sector, the library, archive sector could agree. We all came together collaborative and got that done. Even though we all agreed with that, it still took three years to get, <laughs> to get, on, to get past. And I also want to say something, because often this is pointed out, you guys should just go together and talk. Yes, we do try and do that, but you can't always solve issues where there's clearly going to be a different view on either side. So compromise only goes so far. Don't think that this is the way you can always uh, solve problems, but where you can, it's great when it, when it happens. So the great thing about that act, which has became into power, we already know, you've got new disability exceptions that not just cover print disabled, but also deaf disabled, learning disabled. We've got a new online, a new expanded uh, exam copying uh, exception, which means we're no longer stuck just, you know, only able to put stuff in exams we hand out. We can now do online exams and we can include stuff that's not, that's all copyright material. We've actually streamlined the statutory licenses into like a page and a half. Now that was like 35 pages of the Copyright Act and only six people or eight people would actually understand how the statutory licenses work and that would be me and a few other people in the Department of Communication and the lawyers that work 
um, the lawyers that work for collecting societies. And we also finally have new TPM exceptions, and that's really important too because we've been seeking TPM exceptions to, since 2007. And the TPN exceptions uh, are incredibly important because there are some things, we couldn't use the exceptions we had. For instance, we couldn't, you know, you might need to circumvent a technology protection measure in order to take advantage of the statutory licence um, that you're relying on, which uh, you may need to circumvent a technology protection measure if you want to rely on the exception of 200 AB, which in certain circumstances allows schools and education institutions to use copyright material for educational instruction. Uh, and that's section 200 AB. Um, and so things like, and, th and the result of that change means that teachers can now copy small extracts of film to use in teaching. You know, there was one example which we had a problem where the, you know, Anzac, Gallipoli, I can't remember when the anniversary was, maybe it was two years ago, and a teacher was trying to actually just to get a very short extract from Gallipoli into a classroom presentation for the kids to kind of like do a project around. But, you know, because it's unclear whether a DVD um, has the, the access technology protection measures, often we would say, look, you just can't do that, you're gonna to have to try and find another source, or, you know, couldn't do it. We also had problems with trying to provide disabled students um, with content in accessible formats, and that was a real problem uh, for students with hearing dis disabilities, when you want to put captions uh, on, on sort of uh, video work for them to have access to. So it's a, this, this change actually has, is quite radical uh, in the sense that it helps us deal with those sort of situations which really are in the public interest and are not impacting on the copyright owner's um, market. So, sounds very, uh, what, what still needs to be done? Well, we still need to have a discussion and work out what we're doing with flexible fair use or fair dealing or whatever niche model we want to call it. Um, we are very grateful that there, is, there seems to be a bill on the floor now which is allowing expanding safe har har uh, harbour provisions to include um, the educational institutions and obviously libraries and archives as well. Um, and that's, you know, that's currently uh, under consideration, so you know, watch this space. We also think there's a need for improved governance arrangements for cooperative collecting societies. And as Sam mentioned, there is a, a review of the um, voluntary code of conduct for collecting societies, which uh, is due out uh, for release sometime this month or next month sometime. Um, and that will that'll be very interesting for us to see what comes out of that, uh, that review. And of course, uh, both the Universities of Australia and the Copyright Advisory Group has made submissions to that review. If you want to go and look at them, I think they're available um, online. I think they might be available, yeah, or may not yet, sorry. Um, the other thing we need to think about is like, how do we deal with the issue of contract and copyright? Um, you know, how do we ensure that provisions, that we, you know, that contract and technology protection measures don't necessarily, are not gonna override uh, uh, legitimate ex exceptions? How do we fix the orphan works regime? Um, there was the recommendation, I think, from both the ALIC and the P Productivity Commission uh, to recommend limited liability, where a user has undertaken a diligent search to locate the relevant rights holders. And the one thing that we kind of didn't get in our request for the TPM review was we wanted also to see if it was possibly an exception to circumvent TPMs where students are actually using it for fair dealing purposes of research or study. So that's something that's on the horizon that we'll actually raise again when you do another review, which hopefully won't be too long. Um, so, uh, so look, the other thing is like, it's not just about the freely available internet material being captured um, in the statutory licenses. Um, you know, that's not just the only reason why schools and universities and TAFEs are for fair use. I mean, the lack of, a, we can't do a number of things. We can't do MOOCs, data and text mining. Um, we can't use five seconds, a school can't use five seconds of a film clip in a school performance. A teacher can't submit student projects into uh, competitions. Um, you know, uh, you can't send parents thumbnail images of books with an expert with books, an excerpt from the book to tell them what their children are reading in class. Um, you know, and I'll give you an example. So they, they're prevented from doing these things because we haven't got a flexible fair dealing or fair use, I don't care what the hell you call it, um, regime. Uh, one example recently was this fantastic teacher. He's a math teacher 
um, based somewhere in Australia. And he used, created this great teaching resource for his kids using the music from Gang and Style um, with his own lyrics for a classroom. And it was recognised as um, one of the most innovative uh, teacher, in the Innovative Teaching Award in Australia. Um, and lots of media outlets wanted to show the video. Um, and they wanted to show the video because he won at the Innovation Teaching Award. And they couldn't do it because none of the ed educational exceptions applied and it's not something that's covered by any of the statutory licenses. So um, then it's just examples of stuff that we're, we're talking about. And also, the, now we're looking in the area of artificial, artificial intelligence, augmented, augmented reality. Uh, it's just really difficult to see. I mean, those, the, our current exceptions and licenses don't kind of uh, cover that. So um, we've got to think about how we're future-proofing it, but ensuring that you know the right, you know, that people are getting paid uh, where, where appropriate, and that certain uses that are in the public interest are not suddenly caught up into a paying restrictive regime when it doesn't actually need to be. Now, the other thing I want to kind of say, and I, I know I say this every time I get up at a conference, but we are not saying get rid of collective licensing. We have never said get rid of collective licensing. We have always said in many, many submissions, in writing and oral submissions to government, that we see that should be fair, fair use and collective licensing. We think licensing, whether it's a statutory license administered by Screen Rights or Copyright Agency, or one of the voluntary licenses that we enter into with AMCOS, ARIA, PPCA for educational use of music and sound recording and film, and for school events, they will actually coexist alongside a fair use or a flexible fair dealing regime. Um, and there will be many things that we do and we currently do and will do in the future, well, that would not be appropriate to come under the fair use regime and then we will need to actually get certainty and licenses. But, and what fair use will do was actually enable us to work better to work out what's in and what's out and what needs to be covered by those, by those collective licenses. And it means that schools won't be disincentivized from using digital technologies and we won't be paying for uses that no one in their right mind would ever be expected to be paid, such as using, you know, Department of Health lice fact sheets for school children. The other thing I want to kind of put very strongly is fair use does not mean a free for all. It does not mean that. Now, I want, and I'll say this again, Australian schools, there's 10,000 of us, with about 3.5 million school children. We spend more than $700 million a year buying educational content. That's on top of the $100 million a year we pay collecting societies. Uh, and that does not include what the parents and parents groups also buy and purchase for their schools. And so a fair use ex exception will have no impact on this educational spending. It will have no impact on the $700 million already spent by schools every year buying educational content. But what it does help us do is try to try and normalise that sort of stuff there. So again, uh, it's going to be a really interesting year ahead. Um, I wish, you know, I think you're killing us, basically. <laughs> uh, I thought I was tired last year. I think I'm going to be tired this year. But look, you know, there is, I think it's, there is some hope on the horizon. I think it's good that we're trying to sort of uh, f uh, settle the issues, uh, get down to what the nitty gritty is. Um, we, you know, we very much see that the future involves, you know, something that works for all stakeholders, whether you're an author or a publisher, a school, a university, a teacher, a consumer, a parent. Um, and so I'm really looking forward to the next year. Thanks. Okay, and so our last stakeholder speaker representing archives um, and perhaps bleeding a little bit into cultural institutions in general, I imagine, um, is Julia Mant. Uh, Julia is, of course, I am looking for where I've got her stuff. Oh, I haven't got her stuff there. Sorry, but Julia is, of course, she works at NIDA. She has spent um, uh, many years working in education um, 
uh, libraries, educational libraries. Uh, currently she's at NIDA and she's also the chair of the um, Australian Society of Archivists. Um, currently the president, sorry, of the of Australian Society of Archivists. Um, and her background basically is really on the ground, really about getting things done in individual institutions and individual um, uh, libraries. So it'll be very interesting, or archives, sorry, to see her um, views on those. I've never actually been, I've never worked in a library or, or been a librarian, so I'm very clearly an archivist and um, uh, there, there can be a distinction definitely, although many archives are in libraries. Now, um, uh, I am going to, where's my slides there, where's the, get the arrow. So I wanted just very briefly to run through quite broadly uh, some of the ideas that uh, how copyright and archives intersect and then look quite specifically at things related to NIDA. For those who don't know, NIDA is a performing arts higher education institution and we're coming up to our 60th year. Uh, and I'm the archives and records manager there. Uh, so I do think, I mean, we, we, we've been touched on today the highly trifecta for archives of preservation, access and use. And, uh, you know, in terms of this what needs fixing, obviously preservation, look, you know, the new provisions that come in will provide a great deal of certainty for archivists to feel comfortable copying things for preservation purposes. And I think particularly with film, video, audio, uh, the deadline 2025, if you haven't heard of it, is, is the sort of when format obsolescence comes in, you know, is touted to come in. It's a bit of a marketing in one level, but it, it's very real as well, and the hardware won't be available to format shift analogue tapes to digital formats, and there hasn't been the certainty around that. So I think that those changes will certainly make a difference to many practicing archivists. I was thinking, uh, reflecting this morning, thinking that really, as a practicing archivist for 20 odd years, in some ways it's just like, nah, copyright, it's just one of those things you have to deal with. It hasn't really exercised archivists in the same way that probably librarians have been exercised about it because they're very much focused on public access. And I, I say that in a funny way because, I mean, use of archives is not the primary purpose for an archive. The care and management of a collection or a holdings is, is the key point. But as we've moved in the last 30 years, instead it's not just paper-based archives, it's very much a digital archive world that we live in. And archivists themselves are finding that they too need to use copyright materials that they hold to promote their archives. And if it's not digital, where is it? And so this can actually be quite counterproductive because you have to think about, you know, if, well, how, you use the stats and uh, increasingly, archives are under pressure to provide digital access to holdings uh, because reading rooms are closing, focuses on uh, online access 24-7. So I think archivists themselves are much more engaged with how can they use copyright materials than perhaps used to be. And of course, there's always the ongoing uh, and changing environment of users' expectations and needs for research exhibition. And I would say with something like NIDA, very much an in-house business as well. And I was thinking to myself, well, if it's changed, so if, if the question is what needs fixing still from last year's changes, which has certainly been very good for archives, um, tackling both orphan works and preservation, uh, does this mean that I don't avoid, you know, the classic sort of response to a request? I mean, I don't need to read it all, but I've just highlighted some things, you know, it's the restrictions, the rights negotiations, the difficulties of actually navigating to get two minutes worth of footage um, has meant that a lot of things are just not utilised and so that they're left for people to come into the archive and view in, on site and never use and then also for, so there's a problem for researchers and users and then also a problem in this case uh, was just some footage I was trying to get for an anniversary five years ago. Now with NIDA's anniversary coming up next year, I think, oh, is it anything going to be anything different now that these copyright changes have happened and the reality is probably no. The, the content might have been digitised by the holding institution for preservation purposes, but I've still got all those rights negotiations to, to jump through before I can actually access it. Um, Delia touched on section 200AB. Is it sufficient for archival access and use? The special case test is best suited to individual items, I would say. 
So with archives, I mean, obviously our archives and archivists deal with, you know, here's a diary of a First World War diary, want to put that online and all the rest of it, and yes, of course, you can apply Section 200 AB for those sort of purposes. But the vast reality is that archives hold, you know, correspondence files, volumes of minutes, uh, content that in its bulk and its diversity of authors and locations and topics doesn't lend itself to the sort of applying a special test case for every single uh, folio that's in a file if you want to digitise it to make it online and available. And the other thing that I think sort of comes into it as well is, is certainly the Orphan Works changes that have come in are going to be fantastic for archives, but it's another layer of complexity around duration. So remember most public access archives, there's a right to public access in the Commonwealth that's 20 years and in the States that's still mostly 30 years and then of course you have private institutions like where I work where there's no right to public access and it's just whether we want to give you it or not then, um, you know, how you then navigate through a 20 or 30 year right to public access versus, yes, but you can't actually digitise it until 70 years or 90 years or where's that 2019, 1st of January 2019, is it unpublished then or not? So it's just another level. Now, I mean, that's what archivists have been doing, you know, for decades in terms of navigating past that. But the realities of that is it is very, you know, it, it, it works against public access to archival content in a timely online fashion, which is what users expect. Um, so that's just something to, to think about. I don't know how you really get past that necessarily. That I'll leave that to the, the lawyers and the uh, legislators, but uh, nevertheless, it remains an ongoing concern for most archives. Um, I want to now just very briefly to turn to some of the specifics around NIDA. Uh, Delia mentioned uh, educational institutions and the sheer range of educational uh, uses uh, um, and engagement with copyright, and NIDA is no different from that. Uh, we, you know, almost everything that's done is, is navigated in relation to the Copyright Act, and um, uh, some of that's from our producers who need to, the students want to use two seconds of footage, you know, ten different versions of it for a production that's coming. There's the rights to the scripts, there's the rights to the music, there's the educational licences that come in play for both the music and the, then the use by the library. There's, you know, it's an ongoing daily exercise of navigating the copyright provisions. And then they come to the archives and I'm left going, okay, what's happened here? What are the rights that have been negotiated around this? And a, a classic one I just thought and one that you may or may not be familiar with is the archival recording. Uh, so I put up the definition of archival recordings. It's actually from the Performers Collective Agreement and it's one right, it's not copyright in this case, but one right that navigates through this particular item. We have hundreds of hours of archival recordings in the archives. And I would say that hanging off those productions are also a whole lot of other types of records that relate to, um, you know, photographs and prompt copies and scripts and all the things that go with being a performing arts institution. And so I thought this is interesting. The, the, the reason the performers, the, this is the MEAA, the um, old Aquas, Actors' Equity, they're interested in it from actors' rights and the point of view of that, well, you haven't actually paid the actors to do this archival recording, so you really shouldn't have ever taken it. And we'll say you can do it, but it can only ever be viewed in-house. So that's actually why with most theatre companies, if you can go as a, you can go educational, they'll pro run programs, and you can go and look at archival recordings. It's in-house. Um, they're not necessarily thinking about the Copyright Act when they're showing it in-house. They're thinking about this, this the, the MEAA Performance Collective Agreement. Uh, but nevertheless, you can see there that you know, this is a, a great aim, it's going to be used for archival reference and historical use, but has anyone thought about this when they were licensing it? Almost certainly not. And there are license provisions in some, with some scripts, so if you're licensing the script you can request the archival recording is permitted, but have you done that with the music, have you done that with the footage? that uh, you've bought, and all this sort of navigation around licences and contracts. And it, uh, it, I mean, now I'm much more confident that I can say, I've been trying to get, you know, tens of thousands of dollars for years to try and digitise them, to format shift them, because if we don't, then they really will not be available. And they've been, you know, for the most part, I don't want to say illegal, but, you know, you'd probably be really pushing the brims of whether you should have ever taken some of these archival recordings. Um, so, but now I feel comfortable under the new preservation copying provisions that I can copy them, format, shift them before they're uh, unplayable. But then what do you do with them? If you've just got, you've said to someone, we'll spend tens of thousands of dollars digitising it and where do we go from, from here? 
Um, I don't know, this slide is, is not there, but it was, it's more my thoughts rather than anything, but these contractual agreements that overlay preservation access and use of materials were hold in the library and archives, and it really follows on, I think, from what Delia was saying in terms of this, this, this constant navigation of it, and then ultimately it does end up in collections, whether they, whether they come into a private in-house archives like NIDA, which has some public access, of course, or to the National Library or to the National Film and Sound Archives. Could I offer the hundreds of hours of archival footage that we have to the NFSA, but say, yeah, digital it for us all, hold it all, but I'm not sure if you can actually use any of it. You know, what are the licence agreements that happened that sat behind these? Um, something for the libraries, a perusal copy of a script, I know this occupies the library at, at, at NIDA. Uh, should we preserve and allow its use? If it ends up in the library, it's a perusal script, it was only meant for the purpose of appraising the, the play. Do we send it back to the publisher? Is that what their expectations around this were? Uh, do we digitise all these, this content if we're not actually sure whether the licence agreements were negotiated in the first place? At some point, can being in a collecting institution, can that trump everything else? It's a little bit like, I don't know if you're familiar with the Privacy Act. So when, you, when the archival legislation, when the Archives Acts uh, come into play, so when a content is managed and under the archive legislation, arch archives trumps privacy in that regard. Is there any way, how would you navigate through so that being in a collection at some point trumps everything else? Sorry to evoke the uh, American president at this time, but nevertheless, you know what I mean. Uh, it's uh, override. So I guess um, I'll leave you with uh, one of the half a million photos uh, uh, that I have at NIDA. Uh, copyright agreements negotiated for some. We just deal with the rest of it uh, as we go along and, and work it out, usually trying to have good relationships with the photographers over time or their estates. So thank you very much. Um, the, my, this, I think the schools, I think the education's preference is for a principle-based approach, but um, as you know, it takes sometimes a decade to get change. And so we took a very pragmatic view that there are things that we might be able to fix quickly in the interim. So, and there was a willingness uh, working with a uh, copyright agency and screen rights and uh, universities Australia and, and others to sit and down and kind of work out how we could try and fix some of these problems in the interim. And some, I mean, the, the statutory licence not, is not an interim uh, problem, but what we've got now is uh, a much more sort of flexible arrangement that we can work better together and sort of deal with, and they would maybe be able to future-proof stuff within the statutory licence regime. Uh, the online exam exception was something we needed to fix because of NAPLAN. You know, and that there was just like was becoming problematic. Um, the TPM exceptions was something that we that separate from uh, this principle-based exceptions because the TPM exceptions is something that is uh, done under uh, uh, under a, the process that's probably part of the uh, agreement of the US Australian Free Trade Agreement. So you've got to kind of separate that there. But from our perspective, we think a principle-based approach is the best approach going forward. But you know, it's like, it, we, we could be waiting for a long, you know, how long, I mean, when we're gonna to get to that situation, I don't know. So you have to be sometimes very pragmatic and work with what you've got and just, and just keep trying to, to move the conversation forward and to explain the issues and provide the evidence, which we do provide evidence. And when, I'm, when I talk about stuff, I'm actually talking about stuff that I talk about and advise on a day-to-day -day basis with schools and tapes. 
I'm looking at stuff that I know is being captured. I'm trying. I'm looking at this from a very practical level with lots and lots of information. So I think that's the way. But I still think principle-based approach is the ideal approach. But there's some things you've got to sort of deal with separately. Um, but principle-based approach generally, yeah. So um, from our perspective in higher education, principles will stand the test of time and will minimise the amount of rework that needs to be done. I think probably two examples up we're going to detail within the legislation um, proved that you had to go back unnecessarily was referring specifically to VHS in the legislation. I mean, you should never refer to formats because they'll change. Or that issue of only covering print exam papers. Yeah, yeah. Yes, true, in 1967 there was only print exam papers, but by going to that level of detail, it just means you will have to revisit the issue again, and the department doesn't want to revisit trivial issues, nor do we, um, that are unnecessarily explained in detail, of, of, in technology particularly, that changes. So principles are important to stand the test of times, but using documents like explanatory memorandum to outline the application of some of the principles are very useful ways for us to have a basis on which to negotiate any licences or look at contracts. And I guess I would say one of the trickiest areas, and as you point out, I've been around for a long time and um, discussing copyright for a long time, has been the whole issue of what authors and others, well, and libraries in signing contracts can sign away. And I think one of the principles that would be incredibly important for us is actually it being more explicit about the primacy of statutory licences. Yeah, I mean, I, I do think, I was going to say in, in relation to archives, because we, we still, I think, there's a great general ex um, un thinking of it as a paper-based format and you're digitising. But there's been 30 years of digital record keeping that uh, dominates uh, what will be coming through to archives, uh, both public and non uh, private organisations and so once you start having specific examples within that and then you suddenly the formats are changing. I mean archivists tend to think the record is a record whatever the format and there are certain behaviours that are um, that happen regardless of that. Yes there are certain different ways of approaching the record depending on what format it is but it still holds the test of, of time and so I think uh, some robust exemptions was what um, or exceptions was what uh, Ruth was saying this morning and I think that is the way to go the the principles and I think um, and also the other thing that changes is the user the user creator is expecting you know yes they might want to hold on to their authorship when they're the creator but as a user they really want to engage with that again so the sort of fluidity of that person if it is an individual so uh, another thing that's come up this morning it, Jill, Jill brought up, a, um, Jill particularly mentioned um, the issue of, I'm um, oh, sorry, I've lost my third of thought, oh, of trying to reach agreement <laughs> of, uh, and cons um, um, of reaching uh, consensus. And Delia also spoke about how important that was in last year's reforms. Um, if we do want to get reform quicker than, you know, hopefully only three years and not another decade, um, then consensus points are obviously very important. Jill suggested that maybe Orphan Works might be one for that. Uh, how do you guys feel about Orphan Works as a possible area where you, do you see consensus emerging or do you think there's still a lot of contention? <laughs> Why are you giving it to me? You know, it's like having, uh, uh, do I think it's still contentious? I, 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 I honestly don't know if it's still contentious. I, I think there is uh, sometimes positions are held by um, particular industries because they are terrified about making any movement that might be reasonable might then lead to, you know, a floodgate and piracy. So I think there is there's a lot of fear, I think, from some rights holders. and. And you can see, you know, I have a lot of uh, sympathy because, you know, the world has completely changed and the internet's changed every, in everything. And so we are, there is like a struggle trying to work out what the, the right framework would be. And so what tends to happen is they're kind of like digging in the heels of not making any sensible adjustments. And, but I think the example of what we managed to do with the Copyright Amendment um, Disability Access and Other Measures Act as we show that you can actually come together to get the right kind of policy result. But I have to say, I don't, I'm not necessarily confident that can be done 
when we're looking at the flexible fair use regime because, but I, I will try my hardest to get consensus um, because publishers and authors are our stakeholders as well. And, and they also recognise that we are their stakeholders. So, but it's just like, how do you, how do you address the, the, real, concer the real concerns? Um, sometimes misunderstood um, is what the, what the, what's been argued or been put forward. Um, but the only thing, I mean, the only thing I can say is that, you know, I'll just keep, I'll just keep talking as much as I can with uh, all the stakeholders. Oh, I don't... Well, certainly often works, you know, preoccupies archives and has for, for long and will continue to, even though there, there is greater flexibility now within, since this uh, act come, has come in. But I think sometimes I find when I'm negotiating with copyright holders, I mean, so I'm thinking of a particular photographer's estate and they're determined that these 15,000 images should not get out there in the public, that they still want to derive an income from them. And it's balancing that, fairly reasonable, because this has been a phot photographer's livelihood, uh, against the reality that if it's not out there, no one will come looking for it. And it's sort of, you know, navigating this constant. And I think, for me, the biggest issue is just the, the time it takes, the expectation that every institution's got a copyright licensing officer to try and navigate this sort of, you know, and I think they're the really, they're the impediments to uh, change. But, because you do need that personal negotiation sometimes to be able to make something available for, for people so that they have confidence that it's not just going to be reused without some integrity around it. Um, I remember the Casino images, you know, the, the family estate, a wonderful photographer of Australian life in the 20s, that they were not to be cropped in any way. And so how do you then digitise and put it online when you just know that, that people will take it and reuse it for all sorts of... So how do you hold on to that integrity... Uh, sort of slightly got you off topic there, but an, an int something you know that is hard to hard for legislation to dictate those things. I think. Um, how, how much this actually ties to Julie? Don't worry, I'm letting Roxanne say too okay. um, <laughs> about the um, how much can we come up with words in EMs or uh, tweak with the language to try to address these legitimate concerns and include that in the reform and not just you know sort of the broad stuff people are looking for. Mm. Um. But, EM, EMs are important, but like we are capable of providing kind of clear, practical advice and education to our stakeholders mm -hmm. um, based on actual experience. We can also work out, based on our experience, what things you know should be, you know, negotiated or, or by as part of a collective license, or what would not be. Uh, I think mm -hmm. it, it work. It can work. I mean, we've been doing that for the last you know 14 years at NCU. And like, I think there is you know, uh, uh, be able to do that. But I think it also, uh, the other problem we've got, this is always a problem with copyright. It is complex and no one understands it except teachers, librarians, and the Copyright Council. <laughs> and um, and even, like, even in, in collection societies and, and even publishers sometimes or rights holders don't understand what is allowed to be done under the Copyright Act. So again, it's, just, it's always gonna be an ongoing thing, but I think, you know, it's just education. So I guess one of the things that's important to me is that we shouldn't be so out of touch with practice that copyright becomes irrelevant and everything gets contracted away. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a real risk for that, well, particularly <coughs> in the scholarly communication environment. And we need to be very conscious of just what's changing in practice. So just to draw an example, you know, 10 years ago, you walked into an art gallery, the main role of those um, guards was to stop anyone taking a photograph mm -hmm. of any art form. You go into a museum or an art gallery now and everyone is encouraged to take photographs because they're going to do it anyway and every single person has a device they can take a photograph on, whether it's an iPad or a phone. So practice has had to change enormously just because that's the way the real world works. And we really need to take into our discussions on copyright information about what has, has changed in the real world and the facts so that we can then just say, well, this is the way it is. It's not necessarily a consensus and a deep, much as I like deep philosophical and legal and economic discussions, but this is what's happening in practice. So we just have to be, have to bring a mix of complete pragmatism, um, a, an awareness of the investment because like the school sector, um, the university sector spends hundreds of millions of dollars investing in 
in the communications and publishing industry, and we are committed to do that. Um, and so I think coming up with a set of key priorities will probably be a very productive exercise for us this year. Mm -hmm. Now, because we're running uh, behind time, of course, um, just checking if there are any uh, audience questions that you wanted to address to the panels. We might just stick to one or two. No? I think everybody's aware of the time, plus uh, lunch is getting a bit late now. Um, uh, so I think that was really wonderful and I really enjoyed the stuff. Sorry to cut the conversation a little bit short, but I think your presentations were the key moments. Um, so thank you very much for um, joining us and for 